Hi guys, Derek here from Pacific Coast Auto. Welcome to the Sunday Question Cast. We'll start off this one with a couple of things. Number one, my camera screen is completely broken now and so I can't set any of the settings and usually for these videos I'll set them to um, single focus so that it doesn't search for my face. And sometimes when it's set on continuous focus, which it's set on right now, it'll blur out my face, it'll try to focus on the background, something like that, and so, sorry for the focus on this video. Now, before we get into this one, I, I have a little bit of an update. I did buy a new car the other day. It's a really cheap car. It's um, a 2004 Honda Elysian, which is like a Honda's, Honda's biggest minivan times 0.8, and so it's about 20% smaller. Uh, it's eight seaters. It's convenient for my family because I got three kids now. And it has a mic jack for the voice recorder. And so uh, two weeks from now, probably, probably not the next video, but the video after that, we're going to have sound quality that actually sounds like a human being instead of a robot who got his vocal box stuck in a blender. And so we got bad sound quality here. The other thing I wanted to mention is a couple of things. On my regular channel, I've got a new video of a Toyota Crown Royal Saloon that is going to be imported to the USA, and it was a fantastic car. And so if you were just browsing through the channel and you saw that and you're like, oh, Toyota Crown, it's boring, I'm not into that, I urge you to go back and check it out because it is quite a special vehicle and something like that is way, way, way cheaper than the R32 Skylines everybody is asking me about. And so something to check into if you're into something a little bit different. Um, also, I just came back, and my mind is still buzzing about this, but I just came back from uh, detailing um, and re reporting on a dealer car. And unfortunately, this isn't going to be up on my channel because this dealer doesn't do my channel, but it is something that you can still check into with the power of the YouTubes and the Googles. And so this car was a demo car for a company called J Wolf. And they do a bunch of different demo cars and their main, their main business is doing exhaust systems, custom exhaust systems. And this one was a Porsche 911 964 model. And so if you type in to Google or YouTube, I know they have a YouTube video because I watched it. Uh, you can find the car, just type in J-Wolf 964 and you should be able to find it. And it was really awesome. Think about RWB type 911s. Not quite as wide and not quite as crazy, but this one sounded so amazing because J-Wolf, what they do is exhaust. The whole exhaust was custom, uh, custom welded titanium with no muffler on it and just the air-cooled sound is so amazing. And so, you know, looking at the pictures, the car is pretty wild. It's got the double rear wing like the RWB cars do, and it has the super wide, like 14 inch wide rear wheels with like the, the tires on the back are 295s, but they're super stretched to fit those wheels. And so it's, it's really amazing to see. But really the cool thing about the car is the exhaust sound on it is just phenomenal. And so do look that up on YouTube and, uh, and you're gonna be impressed. Very cool car, cool that I got to sit in it and drive it. And uh, I really like the old air-cooled Porsches. I didn't like them because I watched too much Top Gear and you know, Jeremy's like, oh, it's just a glorified Beetle, but that's really not the case once you actually get to sit in them and drive them and check them out. They're pretty much everything that you want in a car aside from the strange engine placement on them. But the sound in particular is something that is just, just amazing, and especially with no muffler on it. Uh, and how quickly it revs from like zero RPM up to like 5,000 RPM. It's just like wham, wham, super cool. Okay, so that was a little bit of a detour there before the questions, but hope you liked that. And let's start with questions right away. And voice recorder timed out. So we're going to try to set this without crashing. And I am going to be looking down. This is distracted driving, but I am a good, super long distance in front of the car in front of me. Not in front of the car, behind the car. Okay, almost there. There we go. Okay, sorry about that. Yeah. Giant Dick says, I love your videos on both channels. Just wanted to ask if you had any experience with old Honda K cars, like the Beat or the City. Do they rust like typical Hondas in North America? The 
person corrected themselves and they said, I meant the today. Um, the city and the today are pretty much the same car, except for the today is the one with the small engine and the city is the one with the bigger engine. And the Honda City 2 Turbo is one of the coolest cars ever made. And so if you don't know about that car, check it out. It's the beginning of the company Mugen. It was actually the very first Mugen car because it was designed by the person who went on later to become uh, the, the Mugen man, the head of the company or the, the founder, I guess. Um, what are these cars like? I think that they're less rusty here in Japan, but there really aren't very many because K cars don't last as long as regular cars. They're made out of cheap materials and they're really cheap to buy. And so they just don't stay around for that long. People don't take as good of care of them. They aren't parked in garages and a lot of them are exported because they're cheap transportation. And you know, other countries love cheap transportation from Japan. A lot of countries, like large percentages of all the cars on the road come from Japan. And so there aren't too many of them. If you can find one, chances are it's been owned by somebody who really likes that car and so they've taken care of it. And so I think that it would be a good car. You should be able to find a good condition version of it that's not rusted out. You might have to look for a while, but you also might have problems with parts on it because most of the, like the K car, what designates a K car is that it has to be a, a certain uh, length, width, and height, and the engine can only be up to 660cc, but I believe in 89 it was 550. Um, and so 0.6 liter engine is really tiny. And that means that in most markets they don't have any equivalent cars, and so parts can be an issue. And buying parts from Japan is pretty troublesome for any car that's 15 years old or older because cars here just don't last that long. The average age of a car here in Japan, this is an old statistic, but I think it's somewhat still relevant, is six years old. Whereas in the US at the same time, it was uh, 18 years old. And so, yeah, you could buy one. You might not like it, but you know, it's gonna be something different. And if nothing else, that's kind of a big deal. This is my first time driving on this road since they put in a new section of it. Kind of weird. And merging without talking so we don't crash. Okay. Wow, I, I couldn't even, I couldn't even hear myself who that was. And so I'm sorry for not, uh, not knowing who you are. I know you consider 80% of R32 GTRs right now that are available because that car was the sweetheart of car enthusiasts in Japan for years and years and years. But you know what cars weren't the sweethearts of car enthusiasts were the GTST and the GTS4. Those are the non-GTR versions and although originally they sold in greater numbers than the GTR, now they are much less common because they were cheap cars. They were the high school, well, the equivalent of the high schooler's car, even though high schoolers in Japan aren't old enough to um, to drive, because you have to be 18 here. So the cars mostly got exported, a lot of them got used for racing, they were owned by young people who didn't take care of them, not that all young people don't take care of cars, but on average, you know, young people just aren't filthy rich, and so, if you need something for your car, then chances are that's going to wait a couple of months and then that could become a problem. And so there aren't a lot of them to choose from for the GTS-T, which is the two liter rear wheel drive, or the GTS-4, which is the four wheel drive version, which I believe is still an RB20 for the R32, but I could be wrong about that. Uh, so there aren't a lot of them out there and they, I think the reason for that is because they weren't very desirable because they were not super powerful, 220 horsepower. Four wheel drive adds weight to them. And they may have been more expensive, but I don't know about that. And so even back then, rear wheel drive was, uh, I guess had a better image than four wheel drive did. Maybe, I don't know, we'll explore that sometime. 
picked 1989 were four-wheel drive cars the kind of cars everybody wanted or did people prefer rear-wheel drive? I don't know. But whatever the case, there aren't an awful lot of them. How do they handle? Well, they've got four-wheel, four-wheel? At least front double wishbone suspension. I believe they have rear double wishbone suspension as well. They're not too heavy, probably 14, 50 kilos. 220 horsepower. They're not going to be super fast cars. Uh, if you like driving four-wheel drive, then they might be a good car for you. Traction out of a corner would be high, so that would be great. But they're going to be heavier, and they're going to have just, I don't know. I mean, this is my opinion, and I know not everybody agrees with me, but four-wheel drive cars aren't as engaging to drive as rear-wheel drive cars. Part I don't know exactly why, but part of it might be the interference and steering feel that you get when your front wheels are being powered by the engine. Um, there are a lot of four-wheel drive cars that I absolutely adore, but if those same cars came in just rear-wheel drive, I might like them a little bit more. Except for maybe the Lancia Delta. You know, some cars are just so iconically four-wheel drive that a rear-wheel drive version would be, would be weird. Okay, so I think probably worse to drive than a regular R32, uh, harder to find, and probably cheaper than an R32, because a lot of people who are into the GTS-T like it for its rear-wheel drive, and the fact that you can go drift it, because people who like that car are usually into drifting. Usually, well, more than the average. For the most part, the US equivalent cars have the exact same parts as the Japanese spec version. There are a few uh, differences in this, like for example when the Japanese version has active suspension, then some suspension systems won't, uh, won't be the same as the US version of the car. But I think for the most part, they are, they would be the, the same. And then for some cars that were never available in the US, there are some crossover parts that were, for example, uh, the Maxima, no, that's not a good example. I don't know, I can't think of a good example at the moment, but there are some cars that, oh, here's one, Toyota Serra shares a lot of components with the Tercel in, uh, in Canada or the US, except for the suspension, because it's got the Thames system in the Serra. And speaking of the Thames system, I spoke about it a little bit on the Crown walk around that I just did on my other channel, so check that out. And I'm going to double plug, <laughs> double plug my videos. Hopefully you check it out. I don't know. It seems like the kind of video that wouldn't get a lot of plays, and so hopefully people check it out. That's the kind of car I want. when I'm choosing questions, shorter questions uh, are more likely to be asked just because then I don't have to, it's not a really long extended explanation of something that could lose the, the focus of people that are listening. And because you can't hear very well with the voice recorder and because I'm driving and I only have a limited amount of time, shorter questions are just better for for this. And so if you're going to ask a question, try to narrow it down to as short of a question as you can. Uh, the question is an interesting one. The S15 and the R34 are the two iconic cars from Japan that you can't get in the US. They're the two cars that you can find in any super sport magazine from the last 10 years. They've been super popular cars and everybody loves them. So should you buy them now and wait until nine years from now to import them. They both started in 1999, and so you have to wait nine years for both of them. Um, 
I'm going to say a couple of things. Number one, I'm sure you can find better use of your money in your next nine years than to spend the money now and hope to get a savings. If nothing else, why not buy cars for nine years and continue to sell them and you can probably make about 50, well, 50000 to $100,000 in profit just on selling the cars during that time. There's no way that your amount of money is going to, the amount of money for those cars is going to increase $100,000 or so. It's bad use of your money. You have to understand the opportunity cost of what that money could be spent on instead of just sitting there waiting. It certainly would be easier to buy a good one now, but you, the, the price increase isn't going to happen until the car is almost ready to import for the states. Because right now the price of the car is the world price for all markets that are available to import them. Once they're available to import to the US, that's what's going to spur the price to increase drastically like the R32 did. And that's not going to happen until they're almost importable. Now I don't know, the R32, when they were first legal, we were seeing price increases from about two months before they were legal. Now we're seeing price increases of about six to eight months before they're legal. Because, you know, people don't want to pay that extra seven or ten thousand dollars that we're seeing in the difference in prices. And we're going to see the same thing for those two cars, the S15 and the R34 Skyline. But I have a feeling that because of the popularity in them and because of the fact that importing to the US itself is becoming more popular, you're probably going to see those ones increase in price a good year to two years before they're legal. And then people will store them here in Japan. That's, that's possible to do. The person also asked if you could store them in the US and the answer is no. You can't even bring them into the US until they're of the legal age. I can't really say that. I was going to say I don't sell a lot of Alfa Romeos, but the truth is I do, but not not a lot of different types of Alfa Romeos. The ones that we sell are the Alfa Romeo Spider, because it's popular in Canada at the moment, and has been for a while, and the Alfa Romeo Zagato, which is a car not a lot of people know about, but Japan seems to have all of them in the world, because only 2,000 were ever made, and we've sold like 15 of the ones that were in Japan. So it's, it's really wild. The prices for those have gone up a lot, and those are highly recommended cars if you can get past the really strange styling. The car itself is, it's weird looking, but when you sit in the car, it's certainly like a special feeling car. Especially like the roof pillar here comes down, and then it comes down to almost perpendicular with the ground, but then the windshield has a really steep rake because it's curved, and so it feels really neat. The headliner is all stitched leather, and the, the reason why these are really cool cars is because although they are cars that are kind of exclusive supercars, they're built from Alfa Romeo 75 parts bin. And so everything is re replaceable. You don't have to worry about, you know, getting that exclusive 2000 ever made car and then never finding parts for them or having to pay an arm and a leg to maintain them. They also have really cool things like inbound brakes. The brakes aren't on the hubs. They're actually on the drive shafts on the inside. And so it reduces the unsprung weight of it. And the whole car is made out of plastic. And so no rust. Um, the frame is probably rustable. Hmm something I don't know. I don't know, recently I've been making a lot of problems and, and errors in what I say, and it's all the easiest, simplest things that make me sound like an idiot, and so it's frustrating. Anyways, uh, the 159 I don't know very much about, but Alfa Romeos have an interesting place in the market here in Japan. They depreciate in value faster than almost any other car. And by the time the cars are 10 years old, they're worth like literally $500. And so part of the reason for that is because they are unreliable. But another part of the reason for that is that the, the engines tend to get really noisy if they're not serviced regularly. And this scares off a lot of people. The engine will be noisy and, you know, 
people go to check the car. Dealers know this and they know that there's a good chance they'll get a noisy engine and you, they won't be able to sell it. And so they're a really good price for what you get. And there are lots of them here in Japan. And so I, I recommend them on that alone. You're going to have probably electrical problems, some mechanical problems, but that's part of owning an Alfa Romeo. If you don't believe me, just listen to what Top Gear has to say about them. They're always talking about how, you know, every car guy needs to own an Alfa Romeo one time in their life. That's what they say famously. But they also say that they're some of the worst cars ever made. And so there's a trade-off there. One of the Alfa Romeos, and I don't know the nomenclature of them very well, but the, I think 157? I don't know. It's, there's a four-wheel drive version of the car that has the exact same drivetrain, chassis, suspension, everything from the Lancia Delta. And so basically it's a cheap version Lancia Delta Evo 2 that looks kind of stupid, but you get all of the performance and all of the driving pleasure out of it. And so something to look into. They cost literally a quarter of the price, if not less. And so very cool. Sorry, that was the last question. says, Hi Derek, how are you? Do you buy, uh, do you do buy it now prices? Like no bidding. I'm referring to something similar to trade car view or be forward. So we, we do most of our buying through a system called ASNet. And ASNet is a system that exporters can use to put all of our bids together so that we don't have to manage many different accounts. Uh, ASNet has dealer to dealer buy it now cars and they're called AS member cars and there are a number of other systems like that. They're cars that dealers and exporters can offer to their customers. Um, I personally don't like these and the purpose, or I mean the reason why I don't like them is because the customers end up paying more for the cars because they're dealer cars basically. Um, they're not quite as expensive as an actual dealer's car, but they're usually kind of a middle ground between and about a thousand, fifteen hundred, two thousand dollars more than you would pay at auction. And for most cars, they're easy enough to buy at auction. So I would recommend wait two weeks and then get the car at the auction. It makes my company less money to do that, but that's not the only reason we're in business. I don't want to be a company that's only worrying about how to get the, the most amount of money. Um, now, from an exporter's point of view, and especially an importer's point of view, these are very valuable vehicles because they're easier to sell, and so uh, they usually come with more pictures. Now, I don't agree with pictures to sell cars because pictures are so easy to hide problems. I take uh, 140, I took 140 pictures of the Porsche today and none of the damage on it could be seen in pretty much any of the pictures um, unless I was trying to show that damage. And in my reports I'll take, you know, probably about 30 to 40 pictures that are just nice looking pictures and the rest of the pictures are detailing damage. Dealers don't detail damage in their pictures, they just show you the wide shot of the car and it looks beautiful but then when you get the car it doesn't look as nice and so that's one of the reasons why I don't like it as well. I also don't like buying from dealers because dealers have incentive to not tell you about problems with the cars. You know, it's in their best interest. It's a little bit complicated. It's in their best interest to make as much money as they can but most dealers try to hide problems with the cars and I don't like that and I don't like the fact that if we buy from someone else even if it's not my fault I don't like it when customers get trouble like that and it just bothers me and so I don't like to deal with stuff like that. Now the person who asked the question asked about trade car view and be forward. Both of these are a little bit different things. Trade car